Welcome to the New City Church Podcast. My name is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and we're thrilled that you've joined us for this week's message. Every week at New City, we invite people to experience new life through trusting Jesus, learn a new way of honoring God, and walk in a new purpose of making disciples. If you're looking for more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. Good morning, good morning, New City Church. Did y'all have a coffee yet? How are we doing this morning? We feel good? First and foremost, I want to take time to just honor the brave men and women that put their life on the line for our safety and our freedom. They're braver than I am. Can we give it up for each and single person that's done that? I'm just curious because I know it's, it's, a, it's a holiday weekend. Do we have any first-time visitors in the room? If, if you're here for the first time, can you just wave at me? Okay, I see a couple here. Anybody else? There's a few people. Come on, New City. Come on. Thank you for being here with us. I hope that it's felt like home. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask any of us on the walls at the Connect Corner. We would love to connect with you in just a second. Um, so if you're here with us for the first time, um, let me catch you up to speed here a little bit. We are in week three of our sermon series titled Bring the Heat. And it comes from this verse found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, where the Apostle Paul is writing to, to the one that he was discipling, right? His, 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 uh, the, 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 the person in his life that he was pouring into. And, and he says this, he says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So this morning, I'm going to try to attempt to answer, based off of the text we're about to read, when facing a tall task, a difficult challenge, how do you find the motivation to fan into flame these gifts? Because, you know, something may sound simple, but it doesn't mean it's easy, Right? It's, it's simple for someone to say, hey, you have gifts, fan them into flame un- until you're faced with life and you're like, how do I do that? So I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's word today. The text today is found in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, verses 12 through 20. And it reads like this. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, I thank him who has given me strength. Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointed me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecuted, an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of, of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This morning, I want to preach to you a message titled, A Trip Down Memory Lane. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your presence. God, we thank you because we know you are already at work, God. Lord, I don't believe in coincidences, God. I believe that everyone that's supposed to be here is here. Whoever's watching online is supposed to be watching. So, God, I stand back and I say, do your work, God. Work in our minds and work in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You can have a seat. You can have a seat. Memories are a powerful thing. Memories have the ability to provoke emotion, to inspire. Certain memories have the ability to leave you traumatized. I think we can all agree that depending on what 
you're being caused to remember that memories are powerful. It has an impact in your life. I remember when I was a little kid, right? So I, if, if you don't know me, I grew up in the rough streets of Jamaica, Queens, New York. And, um, oh, we have, oh, my wife, duh. All right. She, she, I got excited, right? Like, oh, we're here. We're here today. <clears throat> Came over when I was about three years old. And so, you know, it was, it was rough. It was a rough neighborhood. You, ha- you got to kind of learn the ropes a little bit. And um, I remember one time my dad bought me this soccer ball, and he's like, hey, here's the soccer ball. Go play in the park. So I went to go play in the park. As I'm playing in the park, there are these kids there that are a little bit older than me, and uh, one kid just comes and says, hey, I want your ball. And I thought he was just trying to play with me, right? So I was like, yeah, cool, and I kicked the ball to him, right? You saw the form, right? Yeah, right? You see that? So I kicked the ball to him, and he just takes my ball and then leaves, this man stole my ball. And so I remember coming home, and I was really upset, and I was crying. And my dad is like, hey, why are you crying? And I was like, Dad, you won't believe this, but my ball got stolen. So he got mad at me. And he's like, your ball, you, let your, you let your ball get stolen? I'm like, what do you mean I let my ball get stolen, Right? He's like, what do you mean your ball got stolen? Oh, there was this kid. He just, he was bigger than me. And so he just, he just took the ball and he, I don't know where he went, but it just, it wasn't my house. And so it's not here no more. Right. And so my dad had this, like, this was like the first time I remember having like this, like talk with me. Right. He was like, Hey, I need you to understand something. If you're going to let people bully you around, you're always going to continue to get bullied. Now, guys, can I just say, I'm not saying this is the way we should all parent. I'm just telling you what happened in my life, all right? So he's like, you can't allow yourself to get bullied. So if someone's trying to bully you, the best thing you could do to a bully is stand up to that bully. So I'm like, what does that mean? He's like, you stand up for yourself. No, I'm not giving you the ball. No, I'm not going to do that. You can't talk to me that way. I'm, uh, you know, you, you, he's giving me examples. And so I'm like, okay. And, you know, I, you know I, I admired my dad. He was a soccer player. You know, he played professionally in Colombia. And I was like, you know, he knows what he's talking about. And then two weeks later, he buys me this other ball. And I go back to this same park. And I'm playing. And then this different bully shows up out of nowhere, just as ugly, just as big. <laughs> and this bully shows up and is like, hey, that's a nice ball. And in my mind, I'm like, I know what this is. And so I'm like, yeah, I know it's a, I know it's a nice ball right? And so then this bully's like, hey, can I see it? And I was like, you trying to play? The bully was like, yeah, I'm trying to play. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to give it a chance. I kick the ball over, and then the bully takes the ball, and say, I kid you not, same thing, grabs the ball and starts walking away. But this time, right, I was, fa- I was in a moment where it triggered that memory of what happened two weeks earlier, And so I'm just thinking about the words of my father. You can't let yourself get bullied. So here I am. I'm like, hey, you can't take my ball from me. And so the bully looks back and is like, what are you going to do about it? I was like, what do you want to do about it, right? She beat me up that day. Um, My dad was proud that I stood up for myself, though. But she she was just a little bigger than me. That's all it was. The reality is this, memories have such a strong impact in our lives. And in today's text, we're we're, we're diving into a moment where the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, someone that he cared about, someone that he loved dearly, and he's encouraging Timothy, and as he's encouraging him, he's going down memory lane. But in order for us to truly appreciate what's happening in the text, I have to give you some context to what Paul is talking about, why he has to even encourage Timothy. When we're reading the book of Timothy, it's clear to us that Paul's pouring out his heart. There's a pressing issue in this church of Ephesus, which is the church that Timothy is pastoring, right? There are these false teachers. There are these people that are are persuading believers away from the faith of Jesus, away from the gospel message because of what appears to be their knowledge. In 1 Timothy, cha- uh, verse Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, he opens up by saying this. 
as I urged, right? So there's that sense of urgency there. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. So some scholars believe that Paul is telling Timothy, stay there, because Timothy may have been thinking, I can't stay here any longer. Then he says this, so that you may charge certain persons not to preach a different doctrine. So based off this line alone, we can come to a few conclusions. Number one, there were ideas and teachings that were against the ideas and teachings of the church whose solid doctrine flows from the gospel of Jesus. And number two, we come to the conclusion that Timothy has been the one given this responsibility, this assignment to pastor and lead and take care of the people at this church of Ephesus. And a part of taking care of people is protecting them from lies that lead them astray away from God's truth. Now, Ephesus was a tough church to lead because it was surrounded by people that like to talk a lot. Hello. Here was part of the issue. These false teachers were the type of people that talked and talked and talked all about their knowledge, all about what-if scenarios. They spent their days about these made-up fables and myths, and they tried to connect it to the stories of God. And because they would romanticize people with their vocabulary and what seemed to be spiritual rhetoric, people from the church at Ephesus were being swayed by their supposed knowledge. And look at what the Apostle Paul says in verse 6 about these people. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. The Apostle Paul must have been from Chicago. Because he's cutting straight to the point. He's basically saying they're talking a lot, but they don't know what they're talking about. But yet, the people of God would follow. And now, ladies and gentlemen, now I hope you can appreciate that for any leader at this time, this would have been a pretty intimidating task to take on. I read this and I think to myself, oh boy, Timothy, I feel for you, man. Because imagine for a moment having to stand against the popular voices that are pervasive in the culture. Some of y'all are thinking what I'm thinking. You don't have to imagine because we're living in it today. What fascinates me about this text today is how relevant it is for today's time. There's so many ideas, so many teachings that claim to be good, that claim to lead people to life, but that are in contradiction with the teachings of Jesus, especially now more than ever. But although I believe that in a sense we too have the same charge that Timothy has to stand against these lies, I do have a critique for the church. And I'm talking about like capital C church. I often see us going about it the wrong way. I often see Christians engaging with these other people that don't believe in the same things we do, that, that whose worldview looks differently than ours, and it seems just from an outside perspective that their motivation is hate. But that was not the Apostle Paul's approach. That wasn't the Apostle Paul's encouragement. He's not encouraging an approach that's motivated by hate. On the contrary, he's encouraging an approach that's motivated by love. Watch this. Verse 5 says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. It's important for us to remember our battle is not against people. Our fight is not against human flesh. And here's the irony. He's writing this letter to Timothy, who's pastoring this church at Ephesus. 
The Apostle Paul writes a letter to the church of Ephesus, and look at what he has to say to them, chapter 6, verse 12 of Ephesians. He says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. He's reminding them, our fight is not against people. Our fight is against darkness. My friends, this isn't even like the thought yet. This is just context, but I have to say this. The church is not a group of individuals looking to kick people out. The church is filled with individuals whose heart desire is to see more people come in. Because that means that the Holy Spirit is working in their hearts. I don't know who, but someone once said this. Those who argue in love argue not to defeat an opponent, but to win that opponent over. Now, all that is just for context. But now that you have the context, here's what I'm saying. Paul is writing to Timothy, who at this church has a specific assignment, a specific calling, and a specific mission. This morning, I'm speaking to people in this room and listening online who has a specific assignment, a specific calling, and a specific mission mission. And if we're honest with ourselves this morning, the reality is, is that sometimes what we're up against demotivates us. Sometimes the things that we're up against in life take the wind out of our sails. So then when we read a verse like 2 Timothy, where the Apostle Paul is encouraging Timothy to fan into flame these gifts of God, we can read that and say, how can I fan into flame these gifts when it's always something else coming up as a roadblock. It's always something else bringing me down. I take a step forward, then I take a couple steps back. I want to do what God wants me to do, but every time I do what God wants me to do, it seems like the enemy is right after me, and I just keep falling into that same old sin. I keep falling into that same temptation. Or you could think of it this way. God has called you to a purpose. God has called you to something, and you don't see the work of God in action. It's like you're putting all this effort into pouring into people's lives, but you still see no fruit. Where then do you find your motivation? Now, what's interesting is that when you read the writings of Paul, throughout his letters to these different churches, throughout his letters to these pastors, there's something that every scholar agrees on that he would often do. He would often tap back into his memories. So when we're reading verse 12, our main text today, as I read that, after he's talking about these false teachers and Timothy, you're the one that got to stand against them and they're really smart people, but they don't know what they're talking about. People are following them. This is a tall task, Timothy, but you got to do it. It's almost like he realizes that this may be overwhelming for Timothy. And so when you're following the lines of these letters, he starts breaking out in praise. He starts saying, I thank him who's given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful. He starts thinking back to his own life and tries to use that to encourage Timothy. Because the Apostle Paul knew that memories are powerful. And so what's one thing the Apostle Paul would often remember, often reflect on, often think about? The Apostle Paul didn't see himself as someone that chose Jesus. He actually saw himself as someone that was chosen by Jesus. So you're lacking motivation for that call, for that assignment. My encouragement to you this morning is start here. Remember that Jesus chose Jesus you. Who was the Apostle Paul? I mean, he goes into detail even in this chapter. He was a blasphemer, an accuser. The Apostle Paul at one point in his life was against the church of Christ. 
at one point of the Apostle Paul's life, he was the one killing Christians. He was the one persecuting Christians until he had a moment where he met Jesus. Acts chapter 9 says this, verses 5 through 6. The Apostle Paul is on his way to persecute more Christians. Loving Jesus was not a thought in his mind. Some of you may have been forced to church today, and loving Jesus is not a thought in your mind. But guess what? My Bible shows me that you don't need to start thinking about the possibilities of loving Jesus in order for Jesus to grab a hold of your life. Because by the time we get to chapter 9 of the book of Acts, we see the supernatural, divine moment, divine intervention that happens to the Apostle Paul. As he's going to kill more Christians, Jesus shows up. Because that's just what he does, right? As we're on our way to more and more sin, that's everybody's story. Jesus shows up. And he says this. The text says he's, he's blinded by this light. And then he says, who are you, Lord? Paul talking to Jesus. And then Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, who you, who you are coming up against. But rise and enter the city, and you are going to be told what you are to do. So isn't it interesting that Paul, killing Christians against everything Jesus stands for, in just one moment, gets chosen by Jesus to do something for his glory. He wasn't thinking about Paul's resume. He wasn't thinking about his past. He just showed up in Paul's life and says, today is the day of salvation. And then Jesus speaks to Ananias, a, 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 a disciple of the church, and, 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 and he says to Ananias, hey, there's going to be this guy who's blind. His name is Paul. And Ananias is all like, Paul, I know Paul. He tries to kill us. And he's like, yup, I want you to pray for him. And when you pray for him, I'm going to restore his sight. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if I hear this man has been killing Christians and now you want me to lay hands on this man, I'm like, God, I don't know. He's going to lay hands on me. I mean... I, I don't know about that, God. But I even love Ananias because Ananias just submitted to what Jesus wanted and was obedient to him. And that's the power of the church. The power of the church doesn't hold people's mistakes against them. Once they can identify that Jesus is on the move in somebody's life, they don't think about all the reasons they shouldn't be in ministry. They think about that one reason why they should, and it's because on one day, Jesus showed up in their life and said, I'm choosing him. So by the time we get to verse 15, the Lord said to him, go, for he is my chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. That's a tall task. That's quite an obstacle, quite a challenge. But the encouragement is there. He is his chosen instrument. I'm speaking to business people. Maybe in some of your hearts your desire is to go into full-time ministry. Maybe it's to be a scientist. Maybe you're a doctor, a businessman, a lawyer. Whatever it is, you are God's chosen instrument. There are people that argue that this idea that I'm preaching this morning is only a New Testament thought. And I love, those, I love having conversations with those people. Because my rebuttal is, well, let's go back to the book of Genesis. Because when Adam and Eve ate from that fruit that they weren't supposed to eat from, sin entered the world. They were dealing with sin. They, they were dealing with guilt. They were dealing with shame. The Bible tells us that they went and they ain't go looking for God. They didn't say, Father, we sinned against you. Forgive us. That's not our inclination. 
Our inclination when we fall short is to retreat. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve did in that garden. They retreated and they tried to hide. But because our God, even in the Old Testament, is so personable, he decided to take a walk in the garden and he asked the question that he's asked everybody in the room. Where are you? Where are you? This is the God that we serve, the God that comes to us, the God that chooses us, the God that doesn't see us for our sin, but sees us because of the righteousness of Christ, the God that covers the multitudes of sin in our lives. This is the God that we serve, and so we should trust him when he decides to trust us by choosing us to do this work. The second thing that the Apostle Paul often thinks about is that he is appointed and empowered by Christ. So we have to remember that Jesus appointed, and he doesn't just appoint, but he empowers you at the same time. The word for appointed in the Greek, tethenomy, means to, to, to assign a duty, responsibility, or obligation to someone. So what does Jesus do when he chooses you? In other words, I'll say it really simple. When we're chosen by Christ, it's not so we can sit on the sidelines. God doesn't just save people just to sit. God saves people in order to serve. God has a specific reason why he's saving you, and it's all motivated by his love for you, but the way that God works is that the Great Commission is all about using us to preach his word to reach the nations. And so if we're just sitting, we're forgetting we've been appointed to something in our lives. Now, let me just say this, because I don't want you to confuse what I'm saying. I'm not saying every single person that's saved is, is appointed to serve necessarily within the context of a building. Because in some seasons of life, God is appointing you to be the best mom you could be for that child's life. In some seasons of life, God is appointing you to be the best father you can be and disciple those kids because God knows they need it in this time and age. But he's appointing you to something. The moment your thoughts go back to, there's nothing for me to do, you don't understand how you fit in this overall picture of what God is trying to do in Chicagoland, what God is trying to do in the earth. He wants to use us in our families. He wants to use us in our neighborhoods. He wants to use us within our church. He wants to use us serving our communities. He wants to use us in politics. He wants to use us in science. He wants to use us in sports. He's a pointing us to service and here's what I love I love the word service because it's humbling the apostle Paul wouldn't boast about being a leader of a church he didn't boast about opening up all these churches he didn't boast about having all these spiritual sons he boasted in the fact that he was called to service and then the next thing you have to remember is that you're empowered by God to do that service. You're empowered by God to do that work. What the lies in your mind are going to try to convince you day in and day out is, hey, you can't do that thing. Hey, you can't talk to them. Hey, you can't love them. You're not smart enough to do that. You're not creative enough to do that. You're not business savvy enough to open that business. Those are the lies that go on in your mind day in and day out. But when you go back and remember that you've been appointed to the thing that God is pushing you forward to do, you're reminded that he doesn't just tell you to do it. He gives you the strength to do it. I love the word empower because power is literally in the word. What does Christ do when he saves you? He chooses you, he appoints you to service, and he gives you the power to do it. We just don't spend enough time reminding ourselves 
of who we are in Christ. It's almost like we become numb to the encouragements of Scripture. Because what the world tells you you need is a great resume. And all Christ says you need is a heart of repentance. If he could use anyone, he can use me. Can somebody look to your neighbor, look at them in the eye and say, if he could use anyone, he could use you. Can you say that to your neighbor? Come on, can we encourage each other? Come on, if he could use anyone, he can use you. This is what would motivate the Apostle Paul. And once again, the irony of the scriptures. He's writing to Timothy, who's pastoring Ephesus, and in his letter to Ephesus, watch what he says. Chapter 3, verse 14. When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. That's where your strength comes from. Now, as I land the plane here, here's the third thing. Scholars often talk about, and I, and I began to notice this, Paul would often point to his past sins. He would often talk about it a lot. He would bring it up all the time. He brought it up, he brings it up a couple times to Timothy. He brings it up a couple times to Titus. He brings it up as he's writing to the church. He's bringing up his past sins, who he was before Christ. And he was real about it too. He didn't just talk about like the sins people would be okay with. Oh, you lied a little bit. Oh, that's all right. That's not the view that Paul had of himself. Paul called himself the worst sinner of them all. That was the memory that Paul would often tap back into when he was lacking motivation. Now, that may sound strange to some people in the room. So let me unpack this for a moment. It wasn't that Paul was trying to live in shame. Because he spent a lot of time writing to these churches and writing to these people talking about how we don't live in shame. It wasn't that Paul was depressed because Paul would be in prisons talking about joy to the Philippians. It wasn't that Paul was in despair because Paul often spoke about all the hope that's found in Christ. So why would he tap back into all the past mistakes, all the dirty sins, all the dirt that he committed in his past? It was because it reminded him of Jesus' grace. This was the theme that literally powered the engine of his mind. It was the grace that Jesus had for his life. When you're lacking motivation, what do you do? You remember Jesus' grace for you. Friends, I'm just going to give you the heads up right now. This teaching is so anti-cultural, it's not even funny. Because what... The secular world will say, and they would argue, is that when you're lacking motivation, you should talk about all the things you're good at. When you're lacking motivation, you should remind yourself how good of a person you are. When you're lacking motivation, you should pull out that long resume and start to Give yourself the pat on the back for all the things you did in your own strength. And remind yourself, because you did all of that, 
It means you could do all of that. Now, I'm not saying self-affirmation is a bad thing. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm just making the point, self-affirmation is not going to sustain you, though. Self-affirmation could be helpful, like, you know, a gummy vitamin. Great. <laughs> but if your diet is all wrong, that gummy is not going to do anything but stain your teeth. It's so anti-cultural because Paul wasn't like, I'm the best apostle of them all. I can speak the best. I write the best. God is choosing me to write more, more than half of the New Testament and all of these things. He's not doing that. He's pointing back to his past sins, reminding himself of who he was because he needs to remind himself of God's grace for his life. I find it to be true that oftentimes when we're lacking motivation in our lives, it's because we lose sight of God's grace for our lives. I often find in those seasons where ministry is starting to feel cold and I'm starting to feel numb, it's because I'm forgetting the free gift of grace that's been given to me. I, I often have a tendency to want to point to my resume when my spirit is trying to remind me of who I was before Christ. This was the thing that would spark this motivation in Paul's life is remembering that he didn't deserve this free gift of grace. He didn't deserve this free love that Jesus showed him in his life because he was killing Christians. He was committing sins. He was in direct contradiction, living a lifestyle that wasn't aligned with Jesus. But yet, despite all of that on this one day on the Damascus road, Jesus still decided to show him grace Unmerited, unmerited favor, favor you can't work for. That type of grace was what was surrounding the thoughts of Paul every time he put pen to paper. And now he's using it as an example to Timothy. Because Timothy probably feels like some of us today, overwhelmed by the work overwhelmed by the mission, overwhelmed by the assignment. And it's almost like Paul is saying, Timothy, don't you dare forget the grace of God. There's this old Puritan pastor, Thomas Goodwin. He wrote a letter to his son one day. The first time I read this letter it brought me to tears. I'm going to read it to you. He says this. When I was threatening to become cold in my ministry, and when I felt Sabbath morning coming and my heart not filled with amazement at the grace of God, or when I was making ready to dispense the Lord's Supper, do you know what I used to do? I used to take a turn up and down among the sins of my past. And I always came down again with a broken and contrite heart, ready to preach as it was preached in the beginning. The forgiveness of sins. I do not think I ever went up to the pulpit stair that I did not stop for a moment at the foot of it and take a turn up and down among the sins of my past years. I do not think I have ever planned a sermon that I did not take a turn around my study table and look back at the sins of my youth and all of my life down to the present. And many a Sabbath morning when my soul had been cold and dry for the lack of prayer during the week, a turn up and down in the past life before I went into the pulpit always broke my heart, hard heart, and made me close with the gospel for my own soul before I began to preach. When we remember how we have hurt God, hurt those we love, and hurt others, and when we remember how God and our neighbors have forgiven us, that memory must awake the flame of gratitude within our hearts. Church, I stand before you today, and there's not a day that goes by that I'm not amazed that I have the honor and the privilege 
to be a pastor at this church, to preach the word of God, to disciple, to be a father, to be a husband, to be a son. It's not a day that I don't think about the fact my life was leading me down a dark road. I don't deserve any of this. But when I'm reminded by my past, it doesn't bring me to the land of darkness and depression. It brings me to the place of gratitude and hope. So with every head bowed, every eye closed in this place, I want to pray two ways. I wasn't planning on this one, but I, I, just, I just feel it in my heart that we should pray this way. If you can relate to the letter that Thomas Goodwin shared to his son, you can say that this has been a season where you've been feeling cold, numb. Things don't feel the same anymore. I want to take the time to pray for you today. I'm not going to ask you to come up to the altar, nothing like that. You'll stay in your seat, but I, but I want to pray for you. If that's you and you say to yourself, I needed to be reminded that God chose me, that he appointed me, he empowers me, and I needed desperately today to be reminded of the grace of God, can you just raise a hand? Every head is down, every eye is closed. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. You're not the only one. You're not the only one. Give it one more second. If that's you, you know your heart is, is beating at your chest right now, telling you. It's time to fan that flame back alive again. Just raise a hand and put it down. Just raise a hand and put it down. Amen. Father God, I come before you. You are so, so good. God, you have not made a single mistake in your life. God, no one in this room is a mistake. No one in this room is an individual that you would look at and say, I can't use them. Father, right now, Holy Spirit, I pray in this room and people listening online that maybe this is resonating with them, God. I pray right now, God, that they would feel your presence, God, that they would be reminded of your mercy. They would be reminded of your grace. They would be reminded of your love, how big, how wide, how deep it is, oh, Father God, that they would be reminded that you are a God who is pleased, oh, God, to, to, to give them strength, to empower them, Father God. Lord, I pray, God, that this be a season, God, that for my brothers and my sisters in the faith that feel numb to this faith journey, Father God, this would be a season that they would feel again, Father God, that this would be a season, God, that you would ignite this fire within their hearts, oh God, that you would ignite this fire within their minds again, Father God, for your glory, oh God. I pray for every single person that feels like they have the weight of the world on their shoulders today, Father God. That they have people depending on them, Father God. That they have people expecting them to succeed in order for them to succeed, Father God. I pray that they are reminded they've been appointed and empowered for this task. God, I pray for every single parent in the room, Father God, when the days feel lonely, Father God, when the days feel like they're long, Father God, I pray that they're reminded this morning, God, that you make no mistakes, oh God. They've been chosen to be the parent, God. They've been appointed, God. They're empowered. You will give them strength to do the task and do it well, Father God. We trust you today, God. Church, if you're in this room today, and you would say, I can't even say I have a relationship with Jesus yet. I'd like to take a moment to pray for you too. Over 2,000 years ago, this was the message that the Apostle Paul was obsessed with. That over 2,000 years ago, Jesus lived a perfect life. Kept every commandment there was to keep. 
because he knew that even at our best, we would still fall short. And over 2,000 years ago, Jesus hung on a cross and died a death that we deserve so that we can live in eternity with him. And so now when we put our trust in Jesus, God doesn't see us for our mistakes. He doesn't see us for our sins, no matter how bad they may seem. Yet he sees the righteousness, the goodness, the perfectness of Christ. If that's you today and you say, I want to put my faith in Jesus today, can you just raise a hand and put it down? Raise one hand and put it down. If you feel it in your heart, I see you. I see you. I see you. You want to put your faith in Jesus today. One more second. I'm going to pray this prayer, and I want you to repeat it after me. But church, because we're a community, we're a family, let's pray this prayer together. Let's be encouraged that four hands went up to give their lives to Jesus. Come on, let's pray together. Say, dear Lord Jesus, come on, say it loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, you took my guilt, you took my shame, and you died for it. You faced hell for me, so I wouldn't have to. You rose from the grave to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today I turn from my sins to be made new. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.